Welcome back. It's now time to go in depth. How willing are members of the Caribbean diaspora to invest in businesses back home? Well, that was the subject of a recently released report by the World Bank. The Caribbean diaspora, a source for venture investment. That's the title of the study by the World Bank released in June 2013. The authors gathered data from 634 persons originally from 31 Caribbean countries who now live abroad. Most of them live in four major world cities, London, New York, Miami and Toronto. And they're also highly educated, which shouldn't come as a surprise since studies show that in Jamaica, Guyana, Haiti and Suriname, over 80% of tertiary educated persons migrate. The study finds, in general, the diaspora is very well educated, with 80% holding a bachelor's degree or higher. Over 65% of the respondents are currently employed in the private sector, with almost 40% owning their own businesses. A quarter of diaspora respondents are affluent, with either net investable wealth or annual incomes in excess of $100,000 U.S. dollars. This wealth leaves them with quite a bit of money to invest. So the, the Jamaican diaspora is very interested in investing in startups. You know, we saw that over 28 percent of them had indicated at least very interested for startups. Um, in terms of what they had previously invested in before, um, we see entertainment, um, leisure, music as number one, business consulting as number two, and agriculture as number three. But where we see the biggest, some of the biggest uh, differences in where investors have invested versus where investors want to invest are areas like clean technology. You know, 1% of investors indicated they had invested, but 40% indicated, hey, I'm interested in the future in investing in this, but we need the deals. Also in mobile technology, there was a large um, jump in uh, previous investments and interest in investments. The other two sectors are education and agriculture. Those were some of the sectors that popped out. And in terms of the countries that people are interested in investing in, you know, it's, there's, there are at least 15% of people that said, I'm, I'm agnostic to the country. I'm from the Caribbean. I invest across the Caribbean. And there are, there are other countries that sort of came up as popular, you know, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, some of the OECS countries, um, like um, St. Saint, Saint Lucia, um, St. Kitts and Nevis, um, Bahamas. These came up as, you know, slightly, you know, they had a positive sense of governance. The investors sense that they had positive governance and was interested in these countries. The study shows that a large number of diasporans have already invested in their home countries. It says over 85% of diaspora members give back to the Caribbean in some way, shape or form. While the majority send remittances, make donations, buy property or invest in a venture, many others are involved as volunteers or mentors. However, they don't seem too keen on investing in diaspora bonds. That was one of the strategies being promoted by the Jamaican government. One of the things I'm looking forward to from a, uh, a universal perspective, understand that individuals can be coming down and doing their own stuff, which is good. Small business is the engine of any nation. Uh, is, is to see what we can come out that will have a global impact. Like, for example, we've had something on the table. My predecessor was very uh, forthright in this, and that's called the Jamaica Diaspora Bond. What instrument can we have in place that could impact a large group that in essence at the end of the day will benefit you. The study however notes many focus group participants expressed apprehension at the notion of investing in diaspora bonds. Instead, they much favored opportunities to touch and feel the investments being made, preferring to give directly to family and friends, alma maters and organizations whom they know and trust personally. And the good news is, they've already been doing that. The study shows that 40% of respondents have invested in a business venture, and more than half of those ventures are in the Caribbean. But there are some barriers to investment. In some countries, it's just too difficult to do business. Towards the o, some of the OECS countries like St. Lucia, the specific answers we got were, you know, we think that governance is good there. We think that it's a, it's a market that not many people are looking at. And so there's less competition for financing. There's more space for me as an, as an investor to come in and find opportunities. Um, and they also thought that the, that the, the ecosystem or the framework for investing was a little bit, a little bit less red tape. Some, some countries were a little bit easier to sort of go through the invest, investment process. And I think it's interesting to note that, you know, 25% of the diaspora has invested already in some kind of startup in the Caribbean. You know, the, the investment is there, but they, they've listed a number of barriers, you know, 
the top two barriers that investors listed was one, trust in finding an entrepreneur that they could trust. And the second one was around navigating the legal framework and legal processes and legal enforcement. You know, I think that if we as a World Bank and other public and private sector players can come together and help them bridge some of these barriers, we can start to make some of these deals happen a lot faster. The difficulty of doing business in some Caribbean countries is something many entrepreneurs complain about. I think the main essence was about making it easier for people that want to invest in Jamaica to make it happen. And I wanted to actually stand up and say, yes, man, I support that because it really was a big point for me. He raised a point about bringing things into Jamaica and, and he was waiting around for a long time. It didn't happen. It happened to me that um, I sent for our shipments of eight pallets to give away some things for my um, sponsorship of one of the major reggae concerts here in, in Jamaica. I sent for eight pallets of my products to give away free. Um, to Jamaica. I sent for them in March. I just got them last week. And most of them are all the day now. Jamaica itself needs to get uh, stronger, not only in terms of its regulating, regulation of content, um, but also supporting and financing and funding in the creative arts, entertainment, sports. Because I, I can understand it's hard for people to conceptualize the business opportunities in creative arts because you can't touch it. It's not like agriculture, it's not like real estate. You can't really touch it and you can't see it. Um, but there's a tremendous value in it because the value in brand Jamaica really is in our music and our sports and our fashion. These concerns are reflected in the annual Doing Business report published by the World Bank. Jamaica ranks number 90 out of 185 countries studied. Guyana was 114. While Eastern Caribbean countries did fare better, with Antigua and Barbuda topping the Caribbean at number 63, Dominica coming in at 68, and Trinidad and Tobago at 69. Meanwhile, another barrier to doing business is the difficulty of accessing capital for startups, and that's where the World Bank comes in. They've launched the Entrepreneurship Program for Innovation in the Caribbean, or EPIC for short. The World Bank is implementing the Entrepreneurship Program for Innovation in the, in the Caribbean, otherwise known as EPIC. EPIC, the purpose of EPIC is to spur and encourage entrepreneurship for the purposes of job creation and economic development. Now what we presented on today was specifically the access to finance component. Funding, getting funding to these entrepreneurs and connecting in particular the diaspora investors and angel investors to these entrepreneurs to not provide only financing but mentorship based capital and to, and to leverage their experience to help these entrepreneurs grow. So, the reason why we developed this program is we saw that for entrepreneurs in the Caribbean, it's a quite, uh, there are many hurdles to getting access to financing. First of all, getting collateral from banks is very difficult. Um, they, it's difficult for banks to assess their risk for startups. And so what we hope to do is to bridge that financing gap and provide patient capital. Angel investors will typically invest um, for a longer term, multi-year period and help these entrepreneurs build. The World Bank will be accepting requests for EPIC proposals this summer. They hope to have it up and running by the end of the year and make the first investments by next year. It's just one way that Caribbean entrepreneurs can get the help they need to start building local economies work together to overcome these barriers and that we as, as the World Bank, you know, we want to provide basically a public good and, and with this platform, our vision with this platform is basically to provide a proof of concept to the world that these investable startups exist in the Caribbean. We want to show them, hey, this deal flow exists. It's there. Come and pay attention to us. And we want the, the co-investment seed fund that we have that partners with angel, that sort of co-invest with angel investors to show other angel investors, both diaspora and non-diaspora, that the Caribbean is a place for investment and that we can use this as a tool to drive development and job creation and economic growth. And that's it for In-Depth. Stay with us after the break. Your news recap.